we get to meet up from far and wide. Cool California, there's a great name. So we just moved to LA from Mendo, Los Altos. I'm gonna assume that the sky is orange for all of you unless we hear otherwise, but welcome. We are up to almost 160 people here. So we'll give it just another moment until the numbers start to stabilize a little bit. It looks like people are just streaming in, kind of literally, figuratively. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being interested in native plants and, and or biodiversity. San Bernardino County, that's my home county. To Tubi, I don't know that one. Let's see. Stockton, Marin, Sacramento, Antioch. Somebody who recently moved to LA from the UK, that's a long haul. Encino, Riverside. We've got a lot of different, Oroville, Mammoth. Oakland, Ohlone Territory. Well, thank you all for coming. Alameda. All right. So we seem to have stabilized for a moment. I'm going to go ahead and get started then. Thank you for coming to Planting for Biodiversity. I am, if this works, I'm Anne Marie Benz. I'm the Horticulture Outreach Manager for California Native Plant Society. And if you have questions or to follow up, my email is abins at cnps.org. I encourage you to reach out and if I don't know the answer, somebody else does. So I am calling in from Kasha territory. It is a band of Pomo Indians along the Northern Redwood Coast. Um, my local fire is also the Wallbridge fire. We've uh, been evacuated and are back in for the moment. So it's an interesting time to be talking about plants and the importance of plants here. Thank you all for being here. Today we're gonna to cover understanding native plants, California, why what we do here is so very important and kind of how to find the right plants for what you're looking to do, finding the right plants for biodiversity where you are. So our first part, you know, what is a native plant to begin with and what, why do we want them? And we throw around these terms that it's, can be very confusing, the difference between native and drought tolerant and um, you know, California plants and various other terms that we see in nurseries. And what does this one mean? So a native plant is a plant that was originally in the area that you are. It was, it was not brought in by humans or developed by humans in those areas. It's important because it is evolved for that place and in conjunction with everything else that's kind of in that place. And if you'll note on the lowest um, check mark there, it, they are the foundation of native ecosystems and the basis upon which all life demands. So no pressure, um, but they are kind of the building blocks for everything that we want to do and do well. And California is a unique climate. We often think of ourselves, when I talk to people, we think of ourselves, California is, you know, going across to England or to France or to Northern Europe. We're really a Mediterranean climate. And if you look at this, you can see how we are more in conjunction with the Mediterranean basin areas. And that really drives what kind of plants we have, particularly for a Medi uh, Mediterranean climate. We get our rain in the winter. We have one real precipitation time per year. And the rest of the year, especially the summers, we are, tend to be hot and dry. And as we're going into fall, you can still see that. We, we are hot and dry. We don't have a summer monsoon. Um, I came out of Arizona previously and we'd get summer monsoons. So California is a Mediterranean climate that really gets one precipitation season a year. 
And the difference between native plants and all of the other versions of low water use plants is there are a lot of different ones that have evolved in other regions to be low water use, to not use a lot of water, but they're evolved for that location. They're evolved for that type of soil, for the um, birds and bees and bugs and everything else that is in that area, and also for their weather patterns. A California native plant has grown to be part of the system here. It's grown to thrive in the types of soils that it was native to in the weather patterns of that area and to support and be supported by the rest of the ecosystem, by the birds, bees, bugs, um, so soil microbes, all of that. So California one, while in addition to being a low water for the area, is going to be a bigger piece of the environment of that place. And they make our lives easier. How do, you know, native plants take less water, they need less maintenance, which means they have less green waste. And we could all use a little bit more time in our day, and if we're going to spend it in the garden, we don't necessarily always want to be mowing or shearing when we could prune and enjoy our own super bloom areas. They also don't need the same kinds of sprays. We don't need pesticides. We don't need additional supplements on them in the same way that a plant from another area would need and to support it. And then those things don't affect you, your pets, your family, your community, your waterways. They don't run off into the soils or to the neighborhood. So they're a little bit easier on the environment chemically as well. And they support the local pollinators. Uh, we all have been hearing about how important it is to keep our pollinators going, and many of them, we'll talk about this more in depth, but they rely on the native plants for what they need to survive. And our local wildlife. It, California's got beautiful birds that come through our flyways. Um, during all of this time where it was shut down, I don't know about your place, but mine had an amazing array of birds, particularly the first few weeks when nobody was on the road. There were ducks and owls and great blue herons and ravens all over, and many of those we continue to see in record numbers. So planting for natives really supports planting for these animals as well. And putting all these things into the balance, it helps us as we look at what do we want to choose. When you're planning for your, for your balcony, for your yard, for your garden, for your work environment, for your client, it brings a little bit of levity to add in all the different pieces that encompass biodiversity and that native plants supply to us. So now we're going to talk about why is it important in California in particular. And for those of you who are either new here or new to California native plants, it's a really important piece to take into account biodiversity here. So what is biodiversity? Um, you know, it's one of those, another one of the big terms. It's taking into account all of the diversity of life, the plants and the animals, and how the entire piece is interwoven. It takes us from being a human-centric landscape into being a much more diverse, broad-based, and rich landscape. And native plants being the foundation of our ecosystem really bring back this quote from Muir. It, looking at this spider web, great shot by Tony Tubbs, one of our garden ambassadors. You know, when you, we pick anything out, it's hitched to the rest of the universe. You can't pull on any piece and say, I will pull the, have these plants without it also impacting the soils, the wildlife, everything around it. So choosing a good foundational element with native plants is an important piece. And California is really special. We have a lot of different ecosystems here. We have more native plant species than any other state. And you can kind of see this through some of our other pieces. One third of our plants are found nowhere else on earth.
California has nearly 25% of the plants found in North America. This map can give you an idea of how unique that is and how important it is that we keep on top of the richness of our region. And this gives an even better case. Even with 70% of the native habitat already lost, we still are the biodiversity hotspot for our country. Going, you know, looking at this piece here, it might be a little bit small. Reds are under 400, the bright blues, over 1900 species. And look at us here in California. We are so rich in opportunity. And so what we do here in California really matters to the rest of the world. Like we said, everything is connected and the more we support the species here, the better the entire world thrives. And look at that super bloom. I mean, who wouldn't want that as an option? So when we look at our yards, we have the option to look at our yards in this piece that we see, or to look at it in the way that birds or other animals would see it as a foraging hub. We've got all these opportunities to provide for food, for entertainment, for health in just in our front yards here. So why pollinators? You know, without the native plants supporting the pollinators, the pollinators can't support us. They're essential to our, as it says, the ecological survival, not only of the plants, but of the species around the world, which includes us. Do you know that California has I believe it's 1,600 native bee species. And of those 1,600 species, the vast majority aren't the ones we think of. They're not the honeybees. They're not living in beehives. They're often native ground-dwelling bees, and they're singular bees. So supporting pollinators comes in a whole variety of ways, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. And when we garden for pollinators, you have what you're looking to do is to provide as many different opportunities for them as possible. You want to have groupings of flowers, you want to have flowers of different colors, shapes, heights, types, and the more that you provide that, the more you're going to attract a variety of pollinators and a variety of biodiversity. It's a little bit like when you tell kids to eat a colorful plate, this is to provide a colorful plate in your yard. Now, pollinators have, and many animals have often developed in conjunction with a native species or a few native species. They're an interdependent ecosystem. The plants need the, those particular pollinators and those pollinators need those particular plants. Um, Non-natives have lovely varieties. We're plant nerds, we, you know, we ooh and ooh over beautiful plants everywhere, but they don't always provide what's needed for the ecosystem. They're not going to feed the pollinators in the right way. They're not going to be such an integral part of our ecosystem. And pollinators are kind of our keystone species. We used to call it the canary in the coal mine kind of thing. They're one of the things that we really can't do without, and they're one of the ones that takes one of the harder hits early on. So when you're attracting some of them, you're attracting butterflies and moths, they need bigger, flatter landing spots. They may have symbiotic relationships with ants as well as the plants. Um, they come in beautiful varieties. I think a lot of us have heard about the importance of monarchs and milkweed. And there are a lot of different other types to add in as well. Um, another way to bring in a colorful garden to have all these colors coming to you. They like this whole variety of plants, the reds, the purples, the whites, the yellows. We can look up and see which species at towards the end will kind of go through how to find the right ones to support the species you're seeing in, the, in your area. But isn't this a beautiful version of what you could have in your yard with this moth. And when you want to attract hummingbirds, you go towards a more tubular flower. They have that long nose developed just to go into these and to pull out what they need from the nectar. Um, we've had in our area recently 
a whole variety of hummingbirds coming through. We saw a little anise the other day and the tiniest little almost cup of a nest. They also eat insects. Um, my favorite, they eat mosquitoes, which I live by a creek and having the mosquitoes gone is one of my favorite pieces of having this biodiversity in abundance. Not gone, reduced. Um, they really like the, the bright and colorful, the scarlets, scarlets, oranges, reds, um, these multiple types of flowers. And here's a few varieties that hummingbirds are particularly attracted to. And for attracting birds, um, you've got migrating patterns depending on where you are. Um, they need water. They need the rich proteins we get from insects. They need the opportunity for nesting locations and nesting materials, as well as good food sources for them. They like having a variety of these ones that have seeds and berries and grasses and pieces that they can pick through and find what they need. And our native bees, like we said, there's 1600 kinds of native bees in California. They're our most effective pollinator. And I think all of us have learned that really the bees, as long as we're not bothering them, don't want to bother us. They're doing a really good job. And so we want to do what we can to support them and to help them do a really good job. And in this case, that means providing them, um, since many of them are ground dwelling, providing them bare soil areas where they can go in and they can nest in on their individual sites, having um, log pieces, some little twig piles, having um, areas that they can kind of cultivate into their homes. Uh, weed cloth in general is a bad idea. And if you're going to sheet mulch, which is a great way to get rid of any grass by also feeding the soil and reducing the amount of work you have to put into it. If you keep some areas, particularly around shrubs or at along edges bare, you help to support the native bees in that area. And they like some of these ultraviolet colors. They like the beautiful bright pieces that we can have. Um, Penstemon, sunflowers, beautiful flowers for having in your yard anyways. And don't forget about the other ones, the ones that uh, we don't hear about quite as often. Beetles, flies, wasps, bats. I'm also a huge fan of bats. Uh, I have foxes on the property here, um, trying to include bats in the area, once again, being along a creek. But all of these have co-developed with particular species with, of plants. And the plants feed them, as well as them feeding the plants and helping to create this huge network of really sustainable biodiversity. So if you want to figure out and find out what kind of plants, this is the, you know, it's nice knowing that they need the variety of plants, that they need different colors, different heights, different types in order to bring in as many as possible. But how do you figure out for where you are? As we were reading through who all's here, we were seeing, you know, that it, we've got people on the Eastern Sierra, we've got people in Northern and Southern, we've got people in the inland regions and along the coasts. So we've got all these different ecosystems. We have ones that um, get snow, we have ones that have never seen snow. And with all of those, you're gonna have slightly different needs of plants. So what we start with is finding out what's the native habitat where you are. And California has some of the most beautiful, but also diverse habitat types. One of the best ways to know what you should be growing or what will do well both in your area and for the biodiversity of your area is to go to areas outside of the Gulf region where you are. Take a look. You know, in California, we have everything from these Joshua tree woodlands, which is a little bit like Dr. Dr. Seuss does the forest, to chaparral. We have these big rolling green hills. And that gives us a whole different area than if you're in the coastal sage scrub. You get the dense, hardy, um, almost woody areas along here 
which is very different than if you're in the valley oak savannas. We have all these areas that used to have large swaths of oaks that also need re-oaked. So if you're seeing oaks in your area, oaks are a great one to start developing for your region. And that gives us a very different look than going to a grassland and looking at the various native grasses from our grasslands over to our mixed shrublands, creosotes, sages, um, some of the real beauty of the eastern, the other side of the eastern Sierra are some of these landscapes that seem sparse and then bloom in beautiful, amazing colors. So as you're going outside and looking for what type of habitat you are, there's a whole variety you could be seeing. These vernal pools, areas that get wet and then dry out and grow different pieces then if you're in a mixed evergreen forest, which is still different than these mixed conifer forests and the redwoods. This is my front yard normally. It's a, a little bit more orange today, but I would be growing something entirely different than somebody in San Bernardino or in Tahoe or even down in Oakland. So it's really part of going out and finding what your habitat is, is knowing what will grow in your region well with the amount of waterfall that you get, the precipitation, the type of precipitation, the patterns that will grow in those soils if you have native soils where you're at. So it's really looking at what's been around you and learning what does really well there. And if you can't find that, there are other ways to find what works really well, including you know, going to Cowscape. So if you haven't seen Cowscape previously, I'm gonna change over here and share how to use Cowscape. We're gonna talk a little bit about how, to, how you can use Cowscape to help you find the plants of your area. So calscape.org is a great resource for native plants. It functions a little bit like a wiki in that it allows for people to have input on what they're seeing, where they're seeing it. But you can find what works for you simply by putting in your area. And you can put in Oakland and then see what, you know, of all the native plants that are, that do well in Oakland, we have 588. And that seems like a lot. That seems like maybe a little bit too much. But you can go into a plant from here. Oops. And I'm not sure why it's not found. It might be my Wi-Fi or the fact that it's not sharing well on here at the moment. Okay, here's one. It'll take a moment to load. Okay, Coast Live Oak. It'll show you when you go in, the range is where it occurs. It'll give you an idea of different looks with the photos. It will tell you about the plant. And it will tell you, you know, here's how tall and wide it grows, the forms you can see it in, um, its growth rate, the wildlife it supports, the butterflies and moths, attached to it. And here's what it needs also. It needs sun. It needs low moisture um, oaks. You don't want to water during the summer in particular. What nurseries carry it? So it's a lot of information on each plant. But even for saying that I'm in Oakland, which I'm not, but some of you may be, um, 588 plants seems like an awful lot of plants. And even if you go into the part where you originally put it in and narrow it down by trees or by shrubs, by all these different categories, it can be a lot. So we have an option where you can go into the advanced search function and put in what you really want to know. Um, I am partial shade. I want something that requires medium drainage, um, a low to very low water very easy care. I want it to be really good for birds and bees and butterflies 
butterfly host plants, um, hummingbirds. I want it to uh, bloom in summer. And I want it to be from one to four feet tall to give me a variety. I'm choosing random ones to give you an idea, but you can go in and choose all these different types of things. And then when you search, it gives you a really specific list for what you're looking for. So common, I could, it's told me that common yarrow will be good in Oakland to attract um, this biodiversity and to deal with hardly any care. So it's a really nice way to double check and find really specifically what you need. You can also go in and register and sign into Calscape. And when you sign in, you can, it will allow you to create plant lists, among other things. So when you go in, you can say, add this to my plant list. I'm going to sign in. And I can add this to a plant list, which will allow me then to go into my plant lists. And I have one on Oakland natives. And I can edit my plant list. I can print out, oops from my plant list. I can export the spreadsheets. I can print plant labels. I can print plant signs. I can have, you know, if you are doing it in your own yard and these are ones you want, you can take this to the nursery and the nursery will help you to find the exact version you need. Or if you're doing it for a client, it's a lovely way to print it up and let them have an idea of everything that's in the yard and what they can do with it. You can also go to, from the, the page where we're at with the common yarrow, you can find the nurseries around that carry this. So these are the nurseries that carry that plant. You can go from those, you can go to um, a local nursery. They can have, you can, it'll take you to a website of theirs. So you can see directly on their page or you can go to their plant list that they keep on Cowscape and get an idea of what all they carry. So it's a nice way to kind of pre-sort and find what you're looking for. We also have on Cowscape um, a butterflies list. This is also, like everything else, um, a little bit crowdsourced and it is something we are constantly fine tuning and trying to do better on. So if you find ones that aren't quite right, email me. Let us know. We're always looking to make it better. And the more we know, the better we can do. But it'll give me like in Oakland, these are what I could be seeing. I could be seeing a Western tiger swallowtail. These are the areas where we may find them. And these are some of the host plants confirmed or likely with them. So it's a nice way if you're looking to plant for biodiversity, to really understand and look for what you can plant and where to plant it. And so it also goes in and talks about um, biomimicry in your plant selection. It talks about looking at your temperatures and your precipitation and gives you a fair amount of inf information here. So Cowscape is one of the best and easy ways to really understand what can give you biodiversity in your area and in your region that is specific to you. I'm going to switch back to the talk, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to go back to over here. So as we just went through Calscape, you can put in your very specific address. You can, I had put in just the city and state, but you can put in the actual address that you're going to, and it'll give you a lot more information on that location. And as you find things that you like or you don't like on there, you can create lists, you can output them, and it'll give you the best opportunity for really finding plants that do well on your site. So that we have other resources available to you, and that skipped ahead a little bit. So other resources on cnps.org to help you understand biodiversity and how to plant for biodiversity in your area. We have our blogs, which have news and stories. We have a 
constant stream of information kind of coming through here. It's a way to find out what's newest in and who's working in the field. Um, there's advice columns. There are stories of careers, different ways people got into native plants. So it's a great way to have some information there. There are garden Q and A's. Uh, on all kinds of different things. So, as you can see, some of them on year-round color or ones that are edible, steep slopes. Um, you know, having, depending on the type of garden you have, there's likely more information there. Um, do you want a garden that you can graze from, or go out and harvest from? Do you want a garden that you can pick bouquets from? Are you looking for a garden that in addition to biodiversity is actually a great Instagram background? Um, we're all home a lot more at the moment, so it gives us an opportunity to really spend time and make the garden that we want to have. And then we have garden ambassadors throughout the state. They're a group of committed gardeners who are very knowledgeable. You can look through and see their profiles. They have question and answers, photos. Some of them have um, video of their gardens. And they're throughout the state. We'll have more information coming on them before too long, hopefully including a map of where they are so you can find one near you. And they're meant to help you kind of be a hyper-local resource to gardening in your area. Um, you know, I know there is one in Redlands who is literally around the corner from my sister that's down there and has a fabulous site and would be able to answer for my sister, you know, the questions that she is seeing with her yards. So the, we have resources in both information and in people available, uh, depending on where you are in the state. And if you have a garden that you think is really fabulous, please look at our Garden Ambassador site. And particularly if you're in areas outside of one of the larger cities, we would love to round out where our Garden Ambassadors are to be able to provide more ideas and more advice. So. That went fairly quick. I know we have questions that are waiting. And so I'm going to go open up questions and start looking at some of what we have. And I'll pull that off to the side of the screen here. Um, any varieties that we would recommend that could make for good pollinator habitats that are non flammable or can help protecting your home from wildfires? Yeah, it's a hard one. Wildfires are on all of our mines right now. Um, and it's a very complicated piece. Plants developed for that area are developed for the fire seasons of that area rather than for how we have managed them over time. And they are um, not necessarily fire are non-flammable, everything can burn. Gardens can burn, yards can burn, um, all of that. It's a matter more when you firescape your yard of using natives in a way that will help you to both have more time and have a little bit more space. But we are hopeful, hoping to have a talk before too long on versions of firescaping. And until then, there is a lot of information out there. Um, and there are a couple of people who are writing really well about firescaping in California. Let's see, what is the difference between chaparral and a coastal sage scrub? Um, the coastal sage scrub is often plants that are set up to have a lot of um, moisture by fog. They're ones that are, they have, um, both a very woody base to them because you often will get high winds and they're used to having a lot of fog. So there's, they need a lot more. A uh, chaparral will be a drier region. And so it's gonna be plants that are able to be a little bit more dry. Let's see, how do wildfires contribute to California's particularly high biodiversity. Do the frequency and intensity of wildfires contribute to California's biodiversity? All landscapes have the chance to burn when left in nature. 
And so they are, the plants that are in those areas are to have grown to be part of that cycle. Um, the way we have managed them over time and the way we are, you know, we have so many people in these landscapes now has changed the fire patterns. And so our frequency and intensity might be something entirely different than even what the plants are used to at this point. But left on their own, all of them do have a normal fire pattern. Um, it's a, that's a much bigger question. I'm probably not answering exactly what, as you're thinking of it. Um, fire in those regions contribute to that region's selection and biodiversity. Fires the way they are now may not. Um, okay. Modify the previous question, please. In what ways do the prevalence and our intensity of our wildfires help or harm our state's biodiversity? Um, if they were the normal patterns, they would be good for the plants. They'd be good for the soils. Uh, a little bit like the land that I'm on a year and a half ago flooded. And that was really good for the soils. It was less good for the humans, so we have so we often manage it in a way that it won't flood. Um, we've done the same with fires. The regular fire seasons for those pieces are often good for the plants, but because it's less good for the humans, we manage it in a way that goes that makes us more comfortable. Um, but different different regions burn it and different plants burn in different ways. Does Calscape identify nurseries that not, do not use pesticides? We don't have that in there. Um, they are native plant nurseries, but we don't have whether they use pesticides in them or not. However, most of them will link to their websites and have information for contacting them. And so it's a great time to reach out and ask them if they use pesticides as well. Sorry, a lot of particulate matter in the air and talking for quite a while. My throat's going a little hoarse. Uh, Layla has Toyon and coyote bush on her slope and plans to grow more native plants. How would she know if she has native bees living in the ground and avoid damaging their homes when she plans and plants? Uh, if you take a look around your land that you're going to be planting, if they are in the ground, you should be able to see them. You should be able to notice most of them will have, you know, obvious holes. You'll see the little hole in the um, soils around it or other um, ways that it has disturbed the land around there. And so it's, when you go through and take a look at the site and figure out what you're going to do with it, one of the things you'd be doing is really getting to know the space. So as you're getting ready to draw, if you draw out your space and you're taking a look at where the sun and the shade go or how water flows, which should be all part of the planning, you'll, you wanna take a really good look at your soils. You wanna know if they're clay-like, you wanna know if they're uh, sandy. One of the really good ways to do that is to basically make ribbons, see if it falls apart, see if you could make a pot out of it. But as you're looking at your soils, look all around and kind of look at what you may see with the ground dwelling bees. So learning your land will tell you a lot about whether you have um, ground dwelling bees there. And if you have our things that are already you know, piles of sticks and such, be cautious if you're moving them. You know, take, the, take normal precautions. Let's see. Miranda's asking, what are your tips for prepping to plant natives in a space that previously had a lawn but has been bald for several years? Between coastal shrub and chaparral, soil has a lot of clay, is very hard to dig, concrete light, um, and has had the previous lawn damaging the natural nutrients in the soil. Does it need to be fortified? There are a lot of different answers for, every, you know, depending on who's working on it. I would suggest if you've had lawn and you probably have bits of it that still want to come through or that are baked into it, you might want to try um, sheet mulching. Use, sheet mulching is using usually combinations of cardboard, compost, mulch, and watering. Um, everybody has their own recipe. It's a little bit like a lasagna. You kind of layer them in different pieces, wetting them as you go, and it 
both covers any ground cover that's there and feeds the soil as it starts breaking down. The combination of that and the, the compost and mulch will help feed the soils. So it'll help to make your soil a little bit better and it will help to um, give you space to plant in if you're planting smaller pieces. Um, and depending on what your soil is like, it probably the best thing you can do is to do something like that that will cover it a little bit and give it a season or so to kind of not bake into the sun quite as much. Um, as much as you can keep your soil covered is better. Having raw bare soil is really hard on it and really hard on the plants. Let's see, what horticulture initiatives are coming to Southern California from CNPS? I don't know, Marissa, but it personally as a human, but it's, that was a nice softball pitch. Um, we do have a couple of really good things that are going to be coming out in Southern California. Right now, particularly in um, some of the metropolitan water districts and, and over by Moulton Miguel, there is, uh, and it's going to be going broader, but it's had started out of there. There is a training for nurseries on caring for natives on how to care for market work with native plants. There's also going to be in coordination with LADWP and the Theodore Payne Foundation soon, a training for landscapers in native plants, particularly helping people who are in smaller landscaping companies to learn more about how to work with native plants in gardens as they're being replaced, as they're being cared for. So there are a couple of really good trainings coming to those areas. Let's see. Leslie has a northern prairie land that's been affected by hydraulic mining with approximately 10 feet overlay. Should she plant considering more towards water, sun, wind, or more towards soil type? Should I try to change the acidity of the soil? Wow, that's a really complicated question because you've been affected by something outside of your normal natural piece. Um, you work with what you have, trying to make the soil in particular better. So things like sheet mulching or things like adding compost and mulch to your soils will help them quite a bit. I'm under a redwood, so I have a little bit of acidic soil too. And it's kind of working with what you have and trying to feed the soil. If you feed the soil, the plants will do better. And by feeding the soil, that doesn't mean necessarily spraying things on it or using chemical additives. It means trying to give it what it would need to normally um, to do well. Like on mine, there are a couple of bare areas where we are taking some of the redwood um, drift and putting it over the bare areas as well. So it's trying to plant for, if you go through Calscape and you choose that you have those water, sun, wind conditions, and you know your soil type, it'll help you to find the ones that will work really well. But if your soil has really been impacted, feeding your soil will be the best thing you can do for it. Um, we had somebody ask if it's being recorded. I believe it is being recorded and this will be shared on our um, YouTube page. Let's see, got my large backyard has evolved into a huge, beautiful wild radish garden. I realize it's not a native plant, but however, I was told that ticks had taken up habitat there. So I'm thinking this year I need to keep them from sprouting. I haven't had that happen, but as a warning to everyone, um, carrots can go rogue. So I had something a little bit similar happen a few years ago with carrots where carrots, um, I thought they'd all been picked for the year and was gone for a month and came back to four foot tall carrot plants over most of the backyard. A couple years later, still dealing with pieces of those. Um, but yeah, if, if you're dealing with ticks and you have something that's a non-native and that you don't want, cutting it back as far as you can and trying to eradicate it is probably your best bet. Um, I ended up cutting mine back and I keep talking about sheet mulching, but I sheet mulched over part of it. What you're trying to do there is to rob it of the sunlight that it needs in order to grow at that point and to feed the soil in order to let something else grow in. 
Um, William had a question on bird orientation, and I'm not quite sure enough of what that was. I'm sorry, William. Jennifer, what is the best resource or resources that covers pruning practices of native trees and shrubs? And the best ones that you can do is if you can find a live demonstration. Theodore Payne Foundation often has online classes on it right now, and I'm sure there are others that do as well. So if you have, if you have an opportunity to see it in person, we do have some um, Q&A on our website that talks about it as well. And it can give you a lowdown of how to do pruning in a lot of the natives. But if you can see it in person, and particularly with somebody who's demonstrating live, that's always a good resource. So Richard says, hey, here in Los Angeles, most of the native oak woodlands and grasslands are extirpated, and we can only guess what was here pre-development and colonization. How can we pick plants to best represent what the ecosystem should be? That is, for those of us, that live in uh, very urbanized areas, a hard ongoing question. You're, you're right. We um, came in and kind of decimated the urban, the normal plant populations of those areas. Uh, places like Thousand Oaks and Oakland obviously used to have oaks, although you're hard pressed to find many of them now. So a lot of them, what we know were there in Calscape it's based on things that botanists have found within 10 miles of that spot. So it is a really good option for there. LA also has a CNPS chapter that has a lot of knowledge base there. And I would go to them and ask, you know, LA is a huge region, you know, ask specifically in your areas what, what they know of and what grew in those pieces, what they found in literature and out in the field. Liana is asking, do you have any tips for gardening entirely overrun by English ivy non-native blackberry? I have a section of yard that represents that. Um, I'm not sure how to naturally remove it or if it's even a good idea to leave some. We're worried about it pushing out native plants. They will. Um, English ivy is the devil. It will just keep coming back for as long as possible until you eradicate it. And for me, it's been cutting it back, pulling it out as much as possible, and then covering it, um, trying to rob it of the sunlight with sheet mulching is what I've done. And it does take a few rounds. It, it can take a couple of years to really pull it out and keep it out of the way. Um, trying to get ahead of it is one of the big ones. Any books on pollinator science to rep re recommend? Um, gosh. I'm going to go brain dead on actual names right now, Felix, because that's how it happens. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's Murphy's Law being asked for a particular reference. Um, there are some great ones out there, and I will try to, if you email me, I'll try to find them and get it back to you. See, Naomi can only grow in pots and wonders which soil she should use for natives. Thanks. I would go to your local organic or native nursery um, and depending on which ones you're growing ask them for what their recommendation is you want to use something without a lot of additives in it a lot of um, you know a lot of chemical additives but with a mix in of compost to help feed it and growing them in pots makes a difference I, every little piece that we add into our built environment to help support biodiversity really matters any suggestion on how to prevent detrimental critters such as ticks from moving in? Um, the best way to deal with various kinds of critters is through IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Um, San Francisco Department of the Environment has just put out a good website on um, IPM in landscapes. And so they have all kinds of suggestions on both how to plan and then how to care for landscapes in a way that helps to deal with critters. Um, and that depending on what your type is. My current uh, one is the raccoons. Um, they're great. I love them in most parts. Not a huge fan in the trash. Um, so their opposable thumbs and smarts are not working for me there. But it's a matter of how do I work with that piece. And the San Francisco Department of the Environment resource is really great. 
Any sources that show the difference between natives and exotics when it comes to biodiversity? Uh, one of the best places to look on that is Doug Talmay's website. He, uh, he's got a lot more specific links that you can take a look at it. Um, I believe Kathy Kramer had him talk in the Back to Natives garden tour that went online and probably a lot of it is available there as well. <laughs> and Jackie's asking about the difference between the Himalayan blackberries that are non-native invasive and native ones that are appropriate. And I know there are native ones. It depends on where you are and whether they're appropriate and if they'll grow well. Um, let's see. Would a big leaf maple be a good choice for a shade tree in San Rafael closer to the bay near the salt marsh? Do they tear up the concrete? Um, anything that will, any tree has the opportunity to tear up the concrete. It depends on the size that you're planting it and how close it is. If you're planting it in your parkway, you know, the couple feet strip between the street and, and the sidewalk, um, most trees will eventually get big enough that their roots spreading out will tear up the concrete. Uh, part of it just depends on how much size you need. And what you want to do is give them plenty of room to expand to their full grown height or full grown width and then add a little bit and make sure that it's got enough room that it's not going to reach your concrete in that way. Jennifer's asking, is it possible to create unhealthy conditions under oak trees with too much mulching, um, non-native wood chips? Uh, it could be. It, I mean, it's possible to create any kind of thing around that. Um, oak trees generally don't like to be watered in the summer. Um, depends on if you're, you have mulch that's going to keep them wet. If the mulch is going up and around their base that can create problems if you've got wood on wood issues there. So there are ways that it could be a problem. Um, having mulch over your soil in general isn't bad though. You want to make sure that it doesn't have any invasives in it and that it um, isn't up right against the soil. Give it a little bit of space right around the roots area. See Jay is in search of a fast growing dense hedge their resistance a passable. Um, I would look at Calscape on that because it'll give you a lot more specifics on where you're looking. Let's see, Marcy's asking us with some plants, is it recommended to add compost at planting time when planting native plants? Um, part of that depends on if you're planting into native soils or if you're planting into soils that have been urbanized and had, you know, some places in California we've we have urban areas that have been built and rebuilt for more than a hundred years, in which case you may have dirt more than soil and, and you do want to feed it and you want to feed the, the, the soil that it's going into as much as possible. Um, and in general, it's, it's not a bad idea to have a little bit of help there, but it depends really where, what you're planting and what you're planting into. Um, Neil says the biggest challenge is finding good resources for native plant maintenance, when to prune, when to come back, specific grasses, suggestions where to find detailed maintenance info. Um, we have some on our website through the Q&A. There will be some pieces. Uh, part of that is region specific, depending on where you are. Um, Theodore Payne and some of the other places like that, your local botanical gardens, will often have a lot of information as well. And if you have specific questions, we can try and connect you up with garden ambassadors in your region who know some of those also. Um, on the books or resources for container gardens, it's a little bit like the other question on remembering a name at the moment is really hard. Um, I've got a lot of things buzzing through the brains and a lot of questions to try and get through. But if you email me, I will try to help you connect with that. And, or you can look through our resources on the cmps.org website. Um, do you know of anyone working to create a biodiversity science lab at school sites? With the huge fires, is anybody working with high school and junior college ag departments to use propagation facilities for native plant production? 
There are a couple of schools that are doing it. Um, Tony Tubbs has a terrific native plant garden at his school. He's one of our garden ambassadors and you can find his information through the site. And I know that there are a couple of others that are doing well also. Um, there are schools who are also working on good hort degrees and are kind of working that all in. Um, I'm sure there are many more than I can name at the moment, but I know Merritt College in Oakland has some really good resources. Um, and I'm sure there are quite a few others. What's a good source to learn about different types of soil? We have a few things on our site, Marina. There's also, um, trying to think of the best one around California. There are some really great groups doing work on soils. And soil, once you get into it, is fascinating. Uh, the more you know, the more interesting it gets. Um, but it kind of depends on where you are in the state, and we can help you figure that out if you want. Uh, best way to irrigate on slopes. It depends on what you're planting and what your irrigation needs are. Are you doing establishment? Are you doing, um, you know, longer term support of some kind? A drip irrigation is usually a really good way and you can do it on slopes in a way where you have um, kind of check stops that will help to keep it from all flowing downhill a little bit too fast. Um, so finding somebody who knows a lot about doing good drip irrigation or finding the right class can make a difference on that. Um, let's see. As for butterflies, any information about which plants attract which bird residents and migrants for food, nesting, and protection? Um, Audubon has a really good, Audubon California has a really good native plant website and can help you to find for the birds um, residents and migrants, some of the best plants for them as well. We're really lucky around here. We have a lot of good groups doing different good work. Kevin says sheet mulching is ineffective on Bermuda grass. Um, Bermuda grass is kind of a bugaboo. It can be effective on it. It takes multiple times in keeping on top of it. Um, part of that is just kind of being really constant and updating it as often as possible. Um, there are some things, it's like English ivy. You know, you cut it back as much as you can, you pull out the things you can, you sheet mulch it, you wait for the next season and you patch it and you sheet mulch it again. And it took, I had a house where I did sheet mulching for about two and a half years on ivy before it was mostly gone. Every once in a while something would still come up. Well, we are one minute out from our three o'clock stop. And I know that I didn't get to nearly enough of the questions or the comments, but there are a lot of that you haven't quite heard yet. Um, and there are a lot of who are putting out really great resources. So there, um, I'm gonna read off a couple of those just as we come to a close. Dr. Eric Woods Lab at Cal State LA. Um, Tree of Life Nursery, they are terrific. They are always really good. Um, California Native Gardening is Month Month Nathan's book. Um, let's see. Thegarden.org has sections on native plants. Doug Tallamy's talk, somebody put in, I believe Elizabeth put in all of the links there. Um, wherever you live, there is a CNPS chapter near you. And the CNPS chapters are so full of really good information and fabulous people who want to help share that information. And so if you look at our website or even if you just Google CNPS chapters, there's a chapter near you. So I know we're coming to the end and I just wanna say thank you all for being involved and engaged. And I hope you tune in to more of the offerings during Biodiversity Week. All right, thank you very much and have a good day.